This is from a, um, a book called Who's Irish? Um, talk about uh, cultural transcendence. Um, <laughs> But the, the particular story that I'm going to read from is called Duncan in China. And it actually involves somebody who was trying to, um, to achieve global competence and cultural transcendence um, after his fashion. Um, he, is a, he is an English teacher, a foreign expert in China. Um, this takes place in Shandong. He's actually in the section that I'm going to read. He's um, about to climb Taishan, which many of you know is one of the five holy mountains in China. It's in um, Shandong province. Um, he is there with two of his students, um, one of whom he is slightly in love with. Um, and I will say that this is, this is somewhat based on experience that I did have. Um, I was in China teaching English. I went at a coal mining institute in Shandong um, in, in 1981, 8081. Lilacs bloomed, vendors under pine bough, bough shelters sold turnips, walnuts, ices, tea. Everywhere there were goats and chickens, sheep and black pigs. Louise and William, those are the students, equipped with canteens and shoulder bags, proved lively and informative guides. They translated the stone steels left by the many dignitaries and emperors who had journeyed to the mountain to beg a favor of Buddha. They quoted the poet Li Bo, arguing about how to convey the meaning and beauty of his lines. Then the gentle incline abruptly turned into an ascent unlike any Duncan had ever made before. He'd expected woods, streams, pine needle strewn paths. Instead, he was confronted with a formidable series of rough stone steps ascending up a sheer mountain face. This, according to the Buddhists, was the stairway to heaven and perhaps its purpose was to prevent overcrowding in paradise. The room was relentless with no shade whatsoever. The sun felt surprisingly low to the earth, close and intense, as if whatever season it was elsewhere, here it was high summer. Louise and William were prepared for this, having brought a hat and a pair of sunglasses, respectively. Both pressed Duncan to borrow their gear. He refused. A drought was on. Every creek, every waterfall was dry. Hands on his complaining thighs, Duncan stopped frequently to catch his breath and to marvel, panting, at the thousands of little old ladies, the Lao Tai Tai, who labored alongside him. They were tiny women dressed in shapeless blue or gray smocks and black cotton pants. Their gray hair was hidden under black kerchiefs or netted in squarish buns sometimes with flowers or branches stuck in them. Some wore earrings. A few had enormously long fingernails, such as Duncan had thought were no longer permitted. Didn't everyone in China have to work now? And how was it that so many of the women had bound feet? Duncan associated bound feet with cracked sepia-toned photographs from the 19th century. He beheld the women with amazement, even as he reasoned that they were probably in their 70s. Also, they were peasants. Change came slowly in the countryside. But how could they climb this mountain on those feet? That remained a mystery. And why weren't there any men? The women moved slowly, slowly, fanatically, some of them crawling on their hands and knees. They had come, William said, with the idea of climbing all day and all night, that at the top of the mountain at dawn, as the sun leapt into the sky, and it really did leap, people said they might look into their hearts, purifying themselves. Then they could make a request to Buddha. This old China, said <coughs> William, the government tried to get rid of this kind of superstition, but old people tried hard, to, old people hard to change their mind. It is hard to change the minds of the old, corrected Duncan automatically. It is hard to con change the minds of the old, repeated William. It is hard to change the minds of the old. The trouble is they are, how do you say, have no hope, said Louise. Desperate, said Duncan. The trouble is that they have no hope. They are desperate. The trouble is that they have no hope. They are desperate. Desperate, said Duncan. Desperate. A few of the Lao Tai Tai had younger women with them, presumably their daughters to support them or fan them or shade them with umbrellas. 
Even the younger women had wizened faces that looked to have been weathered by the centuries. The women stopped frequently to snack on a kind of flat cornmeal cake that they had brought, or to kuto and make offerings to the Buddha in the many little rock caves and wooden temples on the way up. Ducking his head into one of the temples, Duncan was appalled to find that it housed a bonfire so fierce that he did not dare actually step inside the building. They burn money, paper money sent up to Buddha, explained William placidly. That temple is going to burn down, said Duncan. It's crazy, and look at all that dry scrub nearby. It's dangerous. The offering, continued William, nonplussed, for good fortune. There were three gates on the way up. The first heavenly gate, the middle heavenly gate, and the south heavenly gate. At the first heavenly gate, Duncan was sweating, looking at his watch, making calculations. By the middle heavenly gate, though, he was thinking less of himself and more of the Lao Tai Tai, many of whom were katoing on the stairs, appealing to Buddha for strength to go on. He wondered how many deaths there were on the mountain every year. William bought bamboo sticks for them all. Louise opened the collar of her peach-colored polyblend shirt what an unutterably beautiful part of the anatomy the neck was, especially the base with its perfectly matched meeting of graceful strong bones and adjacent sweet pockets of impossibly vulnerable flesh. Duncan felt a distinct spring of desire. His ex-girlfriend Alice used to say that he was perverse in his ardor, that nothing stirred him like the wholly inappropriate situation. And she said that this was, in keeping with his entire life, a form of escape. Was that true? Louise, in any case, was growing more gregarious and inquisitive as the climb went on, as if in unbuttoning her top button, she had unbuttoned in other ways as well. Are you tired? She asked Duncan repeatedly. Go slowly, she enjoined him. Take it easy. She began to quiz him about his health. Perhaps she was interested in health in general, Perhaps she was brushing up on her health-related English. Perhaps he only imagined that she looked at him more and more searchingly as she progressed from questions about his as questions to, about his as she progressed on to questions about his exercise habits, and then questions about his nutrition. What did he eat for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner? Did he cook for himself, or was there someone who cooked for him? Louise smiled when he told her that his girlfriend used to cook for him sometimes and that he sometimes used to cook for her. Of course, nice boy like you has girlfriend, she said. Had a girlfriend, said Duncan. Was there a way of saying this without it seeming like a correction? His teacherly air seemed to be nosing up into the conversation, not unlike another part of his anatomy he was trying to keep under control. Had girlfriend, said Louise, still smiling. Nice boyfriend like you had girlfriend, meaning I don't have one anymore. Ah, she said, I catch your meaning. I catch your meaning was a favorite phrase of the students, which Duncan had worked all semester to try to eradicate. But now he just sighed and offered no correction. Instead, he said, we broke up. Broke? I don't have a girlfriend anymore. Now he has no any girlfriend, put in William, in an explanatory tone. No any was another phrase Duncan had focused on for months. He felt a rise of irritation. Now he has no girlfriend, he corrected. Who, said Louise. I, said Duncan. Now I have no girlfriend. Broken heart, she asked, head a tilt, chin cupped in hand. Broken heart, he affirmed with a feeling of simultaneous connection and defeat. In fact, he had broken the relationship off, and the heartache, to his surprise, had proven mostly Alice's. But how to explain that? Here he was, the foreign expert, and yet he felt as helpless in his communication as a student. I'll stop there. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs>